actually, as you can see on the uh, first slide, uh, this talk is actually not my talk. It's uh, I'm kind of uh, so, uh, substituting with Charles Wersmarty here. And uh, normally, I really regret that he couldn't come. Uh, normally, when I, I step in for him, I make a mockery of his uh, presentation. But unfortunately, he has too serious reasoning not to come here. So I'll I will try to stay as close to his presentation as I uh, I can. In many ways, I cannot really step in a sense that uh, uh, he is a very different kind of thinker. He looks at things very differently than I do. So I, I'm, I may not be able to represent everything the way he would say, but I, I'll do my best. And uh, these are slides that I got from him. Uh, uh, all I did was uh, pretty much reduce the number of slides. Uh, uh, and although the title says global hydrology, but I think it's, it's, it's largely more than hy hydrology. It's, it goes way beyond uh, hydrology. So uh, evidently when we look at hydrology, uh, climate change is always kind of op occupying our, our, our thinking. Uh, and uh, my understanding, Charlie actually par participated in this uh, NRC committee on uh, uh, hydrological sciences, which recognizes that I mean, climate change is already happening. So we, basically, the, the precipitation patterns are, are uh, changing globally. And uh, uh, we are witnessing uh, uh, numerous changes uh, affecting the hydrological cycle. Um, Interestingly, uh, when you look at uh, uh, discharge data records, for instance, in the United States, uh, we seem to have a better climate. So we, 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 uh, we are getting more uh, uh, precipitation, which, which actually shows up in uh, at, at discharge gauges. But according to this figure, actually, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we have more extreme events. Basically, what this uh, uh, graph shows you is the number of uh, stations, uh, out of 500 uh, uh, stations, where there was a, a significant trend in either way, either in terms of increasing discharge or decreasing discharge. And uh, what you see is, is pretty much at the lower echelon, the, the low discharges do have a, a, a tendency to, to increase, but at the, the maximum Q, actually, uh, we don't necessarily see uh, 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 let we see kind of same amount of increase and decrease. So it's 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 not getting more extreme according to uh, our discharge records. Um, and the, actually, when we look at climate, we we keep talking about climate change, but uh, for some reason, climate change is actually not that strong of a signal. And this is uh, a, a study that Charlie actually carried out. Uh, out in 2000, and still, I guess uh, it was just kind of re recently re repolished a little bit for uh, the National, National Intelligence Council, where we looked at um, the impacts of climate change versus the impact of population growth uh, on uh, water resources globally. And uh, what you can see is when you look at climate change, uh, climate change clearly has uh, winners and losers. So basically, it's 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 a uh, it's a signal. It's something that's happening to us, uh, which there are places where it doesn't really make a big difference, and there are places where things are going to be worse, and so there are places where things are going to be better. When you look at just population growth, uh, population growth everywhere puts uh, pressure on water resources. So it's first of all, it's always one directional. It's always ne kind of negative. And uh, the signal is actually way higher. So population growth actually puts on hydrography way more pressure than, than climate change, apparently. And the last figure is actually when you combine the two, uh, um, you, you get this uh, uh, expectation for the future. And uh, here I would like to put, this is a, a, a bit I put in, and this is actually a follow-up to the presentation from Sibyl Seitzinger from yesterday, where she talked about this uh, uh, UNESCO new study where we looked at uh, uh, constituent fluxes to oceans. And uh, my role in that uh, effort was uh, providing the hydrography for present and future uh, uh, climates. And uh, uh, what you see here is on the uh, left side, um, this, this column is basically the present. And, uh, uh, basically, this is 100-year uh, uh, century 
air temperature variation by latitude, uh, these auto curves are the maximum and minimums uh, according to the CRU uh, uh, air temperature data record, grid air temperature data record. The dotted line is actually the standard deviation of the last 100 years. So th this, is, this is the kind of climate variation we're experiencing. Uh, we experienced in the last 100 years. Uh, this is the same thing for precipitation. So the, these, these are the uh, um, minimum and maximum curves uh, throughout the, the uh, 20th century. Uh, and these are the, the, the climate, uh, the, these are the forcing data that went into the, to our model. And uh, in, in terms of uh, air temperature, I would say that up until 2030, we're not going to see anything beyond what we have seen before. So basically all the temperature here are within this, this bracket of uh, the maximum temperature ever re recorded. And we will start to step out by 2050. Uh, uh, when you look at precipitation, it's even less. Basically the precipitation is within the, the standard deviation noise. So, so we're not going to see much uh, drastic uh, uh, changes in my mind in terms of uh, precipitation. And evidently the big question is, uh, when you, you look at this uh, going up precipitation, going down precipitation places uh, com uh, accompanied by uh, uh, temperature change, uh, what wins out in terms of uh, uh, runoff generation? Evidently higher temperature means more evapotranspiration, more precipitation on the other hand should mean more runoff. And the, basically this is a signal of what we would see, uh, expect to see in terms of uh, runoff change. And uh, one of the striking figure to me on this figure is that we have these four storyline, uh, really kind of catching stories, uh, that don't really show much difference. So it looks like to me that regardless of what we do, it's, it's kind of we're heading to the same direction. Uh, if I wanted to be cynical, I would say that all we can do with different policies is just uh, uh, um, kind of delay uh, achieving a, a, a climate nirvana. If, uh, if I like, I personally kind of like warmer temperature and my dream is actually move to Canada and have a beachfront property on the Hudson Bay. So <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, what's, what's striking to me is that this lower figure is basically running our water balance water transport model with turning on and off uh, human impact. So, so basically this is, this is a contemporary impact that humans have in ter terms of picking up, taking up water for irrigation. So this, in, by and large, is in the same magnitude that, that we are anticipating in, in the future climate. So, so humans are already altering significantly the, uh, the hydrological cycle in a, in a really, really strong way. And, and this is just the water amount. If, if you factor in water quality, then it's even more, more striking. So to some degree, uh, I'm, I'm kind of puzzled why, uh, why climate change kind of uh, uh, still the, the agenda of all the other issues. And th this is another figure that I uh, put in. It was, it's extra beyond what Charlie uh, gave to me. This is a paper by Ruxlam et al. Uh, uh, what I, I find really intriguing in terms of uh, our planetary boundaries. And, and yes, in here you have uh, climate change is one of the, the planetary boundaries, but basically we are reaching planetary boundaries in a number of ways. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, humans are not now uh, fixating more nitrogen than uh, natural ecosystems. So we, basically we are completely altering the nitrogen cycle of, of this planet. Um, and these have, been, they have a severe impact on, on um, where we are heading. And uh, when we look at water, uh, this is basically Charlie's main message is that Water traditionally is viewed as a kind of regional, uh, local issue, local resource and local problem. And, uh, but when we look at all, all over the globe, uh, basically a kind of global pattern em emerges, which, uh, which I, we believe we need, we'll need global attention. So, so basically what, what uh, uh, he argues that uh, uh, we should somehow find ways to elevate uh, uh, water-related issues, and not necessarily, actually, person, I, I, I would like to go beyond water. Uh, a number of other issues which, which are, are just as severe as climate change, uh, maybe even more. And uh, one of the uh, um, attempts with the, what he, he and the, a team of researchers uh, tried recently was uh, uh, quantifying this, this impact on, on water resources in, in a way where you can express it, how, what we are seeing globally. And uh, 
Um, finally, he managed to get this paper published in Nature, which was kind of interesting that original Nature uh, editors flatly rejected the paper without sending out to review. So I mean, Charlie had to write a really strong uh, rebuttal. And ultimately, uh, it was reviewed. One of the reviewers uh, admired, simply admired the paper to, to the degree that we, it ended up being the front page uh, story for uh, 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 nature. So in this work, basically what uh, we tried to do, and it was a really, I would say, painstaking, painful exercise in many, many ways, is to collect as much data as we can on, on the state of the water system. Uh, as you can see, there, there were, we had data on, on watershed disturbance, like uh, cropland imperviousness, livestock density, etc. cetera. Uh, water resources development, like uh, small dam, large dams, uh, uh, river network fragmentations. And uh, we had uh, uh, a group of uh, in data on, on various pollutants, uh, uh, soil sanitation, uh, salinization, uh, nitrogen loads, phosphorus loads, et cetera, uh, uh, biotic uh, stress. Basically, we had ultimately 23 global data fields that, uh, first of all, we, we needed to collect. We needed to go through a really painful exercise to actually validate them whether they are meaningful, they are really representing what we, we were uh, expecting. And then basically put it into, uh, I mean, this is uh, one of the, the data set, uh, the, the nitrogen uh, pollution. As I mentioned before, uh, we are already putting more nitrogen into uh, uh, the water system than the natural system would. Um, and there, there were a couple other data that we put together. Uh, this is uh, um, the reservoir database that we used for uh, this work. Uh, we worked together with uh, a number of uh, international collaborating partner to assemble this global uh, reservoir database uh, called GRAND, which was basically consolidating existing global data sets. We worked together with a number of teams who tried to assemble global reservoir data sets before, and we took all of them and tried to uh, consolidate them into a, a unified uh, database. And uh, this is where I would stop for a minute and uh, say that these are the kind of work where I'm not sure science, uh, the scientific committee always have the right uh, value judgment. Uh, this work took like three years for us to produce and uh, another three years to publish. Basically, we went through, I think, uh, three or four journals before uh, one accepted it because it was always regarded, oh, this is a technicality. Every reviewer said, this is a, a fantastic data set, very much needed, but there's no science producing such a data. And, uh, and ultimately, the way we were able to publish was we put some uh, flag, flag waving about how, how reservoirs are destroying everything. So I kind of question why, why just presenting the data was not enough. So I wish, if, uh, because we are living in this world of uh, publish or peril, I wish there, if there were mechanisms for producing data like this and get acknowledgement for this. And uh, if I go back to the 23 data set, what I, I uh, mentioned before, one of the striking fe features is that many of the data sets were actually fairly obsolete, fairly old, 10, 10 15 years old. It looks like producing a data set first has some merit. Basically, that's something you can publish. but. Doing an update, getting a better nitrogen loading data set, getting a better methane loading data set is not that fancy anymore. It's not that sexy in terms of sciences. And basically, we are lacking these new versions, improved versions, improved resolution. So that's, that's kind of my critique of this whole uh, effort. And, and, uh, and I find it re repeatedly that it's kind of difficult to justify spending effort to make, make our data better. So there, there's a lot of interest, there was a lot of interest in this work in the sense that everyone loves the, the, the result, but uh, basically putting, putting energy to get the data right was uh, kind of gets less emphasis. In this work, what we did was with the 23 data sets, uh, we put them into this, uh, uh, a, a fairly complicated kind of weighting scheme, which, which allowed us to, first of all, do, uh, a weighting according to I mean, local weighting versus up, uh, calculate upstream uh, contributions for the different uh, 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 parameters. And uh, we, we kind of put each variable into a, a, a normalized form. And uh, at the end of the day, we put together some sort of weighting, working with a number of experts uh, to express 
what these, these different data sets all together tell us uh, in terms of uh, uh, threats to uh, biodiversity versus threats to um, uh, water security. And uh, the rationale for actually to look at uh, biodiversity, particularly for freshwater, freshwaters are uh, the, the prime domain for, for uh, biodiversity. So if you look at uh, the number of species per, per square uh, uh, kilometers or, or uh, by area, basically fresh waters are the one where you see the most biodiversity. So despite of, uh, of uh, uh, inland waters account only for 1% of, of the, the continental land, 10% uh, of the known animal species live in those waters. So, so, so fresh waters are really the home for, for biodiversity. So, so that's why uh, looking at biodiversity in fresh water seems to be very important. Uh, the, the water resources, uh, water security is obvious. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the water security for us. And I think that the, the surprise of this uh, work was that when you look at the two aspects, you get two very different words. So if, if, uh, basically, if you are a, a human, you are better to live in Europe. I mean, it's in Europe, we are able to provide uh, uh, secure water to everyone. Uh, if you live in Africa, uh, you, you have bad luck I mean, uh, in, uh, as a human and uh, as a, a way of accessing uh, uh, water. If you are a fish, you are still probably better in, in Africa. In, in, as a fish, it's still more pristine, it, it's, it's still more, it has more the biodiversity, and, and uh, developed nations, uh, developed countries like the United States or Europe shows up as real red, where basically we, we already destroyed uh, biodiversity significantly. So this, this uh, difference in the, uh, the two words is, is kind of striking. And, uh, uh, the evident the question is why it's so different and uh, I mean one of the differences actually comes from that in the developed world we have the resources to secure water for ourselves so we, we have the money to uh, uh, to provide water regardless of what happens uh, in the developing world uh, basically one uh, uh, one billion people lack access to drinking water and, and, and one thing that I would like to add to it is um, uh, these people largely live on one on a dollar per day uh, annual income, which is like uh, my round trip ticket was about 300 bucks. So that's their annual annual income. So if you are uh, sympathizing with the, the Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street, the difference between our five to six digit salaries versus the, the ones who live on seven plus digit is about the same as those people, these one billion people living on uh, three plus digit uh, uh, income. So, uh, and that's again, a, a, a 1.7 million people die today uh, just on uh, water related uh, illnesses. And uh, I sometimes have trouble why we're talking about uh, uh, I mean, migrations in, in future climate scenarios when we have such serious issues uh, today. Um, so, uh, oops, this is, uh, I, actually I was skipping this guy, uh, uh, slides. Uh, I want to go this one. Basically this shows the same, uh, uh, concept of the issue, what I mentioned, that in the world we actually have the money to, to uh, secure uh, water resources and basically what, what happens typically is uh, as income goes up, first we start to destroy things. So basically we, we put in infrastructure that destroys biodiversity, destroys uh, uh, water quality, etc. But then as we get rich, Basically, the, we, we, we are able to kind of bring it back by investing more. So if, if, if you have a higher GDP, you, you will start to have money to, to reduce threats. To, uh, typically, what we do is reduce threats to, to water resources, but typically, we don't really have the resources to restore biodiversity. So for the challenge for the future, is I, I guess, is, is to find out how, how people in the developing world could, could kind of take this path uh, without destroying uh, the environment. So this, I think the, the, our role would be to, as scientists, to find uh, alternatives, uh, alternative development path strategies for them to, to uh, uh, develop into, into the future without destroying their environment. And uh, uh, th these are the conclusions of this particular paper. Uh, uh, so basically, the, the human impact is already pandemic. It's it's uh, it's global, and uh, uh, human. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, you can read it, uh, read these conclusions. Um, I guess I will. Uh, he he provided a couple of slides in terms of uh, um, scaling, uh, which I kind of skipped to the point where uh, this this was a study. This was a uh, effort uh, for the Arctic Arctic. Uh, um, system science, uh, uh, looking at uh, scaling issues in the Arctic. But, but I think one of, some of the findings in terms of scaling applies to uh, not only the Arctic. And these, are, these were the key, the key findings in terms of scaling, uh, uh, where basically, one of the, to me, the striking feature is that, that scales has very different uh, uh, meanings for different disciplines. And, uh, and basically, with di different disciplines, we have difficulties communicating between scales. And uh, uh, in, in some sense, uh, my, my addition to it would be uh, sometimes I find difficult when people talk about scales that they talk about scales as if, uh, if processes were different at different scales. And I, I would have to object that. So I would, I would like to live, li think through, hydro think hydrology and think, think about what we are doing in a way where I think the same laws should apply to each, every scales. And uh, if there are differences, that's because uh, we, we lump things together. It's, it's probably uh, more of our, our inefficiency in terms of dealing with details, maybe when we do work at uh, large scales, than being the, the, the process is very different. And I, I also normally uh, have difficulties when I see uh, heavy use of calibration, because in our models, we always try to put uh, f uh, meaningful values for every parameters. I don't necessarily like the idea to, to tune a mo model into way outside of the realm of, of uh, uh, plausible, uh, uh, their plausible meanings, uh, or values. Uh, and I, I will stop here. Gisherma uh, Wild, BOEM. Have you or anyone you know uh, looked at the impact of environmental impact of different policies and legisl legislation on, let's say, hydro uh, hydrology, um, vegetation, and similar issues? Um. I wouldn't say we did uh, any anything comprehensively. Uh, like, for instance, this uh, global news work that uh, Sibyl uh, mentioned yesterday uh, indeed looked at uh, the impact of basically there were scenario we used scenarios where uh, there were different policies implemented how how we are going to address uh, water quality, how humanity is going to address water quality issues and and basically we tried to simulate how uh, that translates in in, in hydrological. Uh, in, in terms of what kind of hydrology emerges and what kind of uh, uh, water quality responses you see. Uh, in that particular word, I would say I personally did not try to do any of the uh, scenarios myself. So basically everything was given to me. Uh, uh, one of the interesting work, for instance, was uh, uh, I had to do uh, place reservoirs into the future because our model uh, needed reservoir locations. But basically, I was given uh, reservoir capacity according to the image model, and, and my role was simply just trying to place those reservoirs. I didn't really try to play what happens if you put reservoirs here versus there. So uh, in, in that sense, we didn't really do the, the policy analysis per se, but we did work with the scenarios given to us as uh, different uh, outcomes. Yeah, thank you. My question was more uh, aligned with, uh, I know there are countries, uh, the international border between two countries that have different policies on protection of the environment. And you can see from satellite pictures uh, how the vegetation, for, in for instance, dramatically changes at the border. And, uh, and that affects, of course, the amount of nutrients in the nearby rivers and so on. That, that was more or less the, the intent of my, my question. Yeah, I mean, uh we, we incorporate that, in, I think, into our analysis just 
because we use data that would uh, come from different countries. So we, it, we would see those uh, signals. We actually did uh, work with the UNESCO uh, World Water Assessment Program, where we, are, we provided uh, water budgets or water balances per countries and, and tabulate how much water is coming originally from country, how, how water is uh, uh, traded between, uh, exchanged between countries, etc. But again, uh, it's more, what we do is typically more, more of the reactive way. We just we sure. take whatever data is given to us and we, we uh, kind of repackage it. But uh, I wouldn't say we looked at what's the policy impact of, uh, of being more conscious about using less water, more water. Thank you. Um, maybe I have a question for you, Balash. Um, <clears throat> maybe you could uh, take a minute and tell us a little bit the, about the water balance model. Uh, our water balance model is actually, uh, uh, first of all, it, it is definitely was the first global water balance model. So when I started to work with Charlie, uh, I thought it was actually crazy to uh, to attempt hydrological modeling at that scale. Uh, historically, I mean, the whole story of, of how it emerged was kind of interesting from a point of view. Uh, there was some imaginary room back in the, the 80s when uh, the Woods Hole of, uh, uh, Marine Biological Laboratory people and uh, some people at UNH wanted to develop a terrestrial ecosystem model. And basically, the motivation to develop a, a global hydrological model was to support uh, TAM. And there was this room where, where the question was raised that who would want to write the, the water balance model? And nobody raised their hand. And Charlie ended up saying, okay, I'll do it. So that's how he got into uh, uh, large scale global uh, water balance modeling. And this, originally it was a very simple, like a half de uh, water balance calculations on a half degree resolution and uh, kind of flow routing at a half resolution uh, uh, grid. And over time, it kind of emerged as a useful tool to assess uh, water quantity uh, globally. And uh, it, later on, it was sometimes criticized for being too simplistic. We, we tend to do what we do. Uh, our model is definitely a, a amongst the simpler water balance models. But we participated in uh, modern intercooperations with the EU Watch program. And what I felt was that uh, a PPM was kind of a solid performer. It didn't uh, do work spectacular where in, well in any region, but it wasn't really stupid in others either. While the other participants were, there were models which were heavily tuned for one region and uh, where they did really well, but then did poorly somewhere else. So uh, our philosophy with water balance models is, is actually to try to minimize the complexity, partly because we think uh, if you add more, uh, more uh, complexity, you end up uh, having difficulty with parameterization, getting the, uh, all the uncertainty, the input data. So the, this, in the simplest form, uh, the water balance model, we use air temperature and precipitation as the driver, end of story. Uh, we have means to incorporate more complicated solutions, which would take vapor pressure, uh, wind fields, et cetera. But basically, once you do that, you have to acknowledge that all of those variables comes with their own error terms. So it's not necessarily an improvement to, to make uh, um, a water balance calculation uh, more more, more complex. So that's uh, pretty much our philosophy. Okay, thank you, uh, Balash, very much.